Have you ever visited a location that just due to its size or its architecture that you knew you were someplace special? Dare I say someplace sacred? Have you ever been to a repository of information that was so large that you knew a single person could spend their whole life studying the information contained there and not make it through it all? Welcome to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis and today I'll be talking about my personal take on the National War I Museum at Liberty Memorial. The National World War I Museum at Liberty Memorial is such a unique place to visit. I've been to other memorials, such as the Vietnam Wall or the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C., and when you're in those type of places, you feel really a sense of sacredness or reverence as you look through the memorials. The National World War I Museum has that same type of architecture that inspires kind of the feeling that you're in some place sacred but yet it offers so much more given the fact that it contains a museum where such rich learning about the World War I and that period in world history can be gained. The more I studied the museum, the more I couldn't help but compare this museum in my mind to a church. The center tower itself reminded me of the church steeple reaching into the heavens, wanting something from the divine, to be forgiven or to seek for a better life for all humanity. The museum itself contains several fountains and a reflection pool. And as you walk into the museum, I couldn't help but think that this reflection pool was very much of what we'd think of as a baptismal font as we walked into the church. The ceremonial waters that will somehow forgive us for what happened during the First World War and hopefully offer us a world without sin or without this type of warfare into the future. You cannot help but think of the tremendous loss of life while visiting this museum. If you walk into either exhibit hall or memory hall, you walk by giant urns that remind you of the ashes of all the soldiers that died during that war. If you enter the main museum and cross over the Paul Sutherland Bridge, you cross over a field of poppies, 9,000 poppies, each of which represent 1,000 lives lost in the war. So symbolically, as you cross across the bridge, you cross the 9 million dead that died during that war. There's a beautiful architecture frieze on the north side of the building. Being 148 feet long and 18 feet tall, it is one of the largest friezes in the world. It draws on much biblical symbolism in displaying the desire to get mankind to convert the weapons of war back into civilian implements to live peacefully in the prosperous world. The design for this museum was created in 1922. I often wonder if the impact of the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt had upon this museum, having been discovered in the same year. There are two Assyrian sphinxes displayed at the museum. One, called Memory, faces towards the east, and it covers its face, not wanting to see the horrors of the war on the French battlefield. The other one is named Future looks towards the west and covers his eyes to a future that is yet still unknown to us. I often wondered if Egyptian style was selected to symbolize the desire to have this sacrifice be remembered for thousands of years to come. In both memory and exhibit hall you will find very rich art deco detail inside the architecture of the building. These buildings are as much of work of art as they are a place of remembering. As you transition through the museum, you'll encounter the Kemper Horizon Theater. The film that's displayed there is definitely a remarkable experience, and anything I describe to you on this film will fall far short of the experience of sitting through the display they have for you there. As an audience member, you sit on the second floor, and you look down into what is a life-size reproduction of a battlefield. Displayed there are soldiers crossing the battlefield on duckboard, several destroyed artillery pieces, and destroyed buildings. In front of you are displayed pictures and videos to describe how the Americans were drawn into the war. This theater production is quite remarkable as down on the lower gallery on the various different destroyed buildings, there are separate images that are projected. So in order to get all the information displayed in that video, you would have to watch the theater several times. One thing that really struck me in the museum is that they have two child size uniforms on display one being German and one being American. Having been a veteran myself, I instantly thought of my own sons when I deployed. 
It makes me wonder how much those child felt the patriotism and the pride in their fathers as they wore those uniforms. And it brings up a very sad question of wondering whether their fathers came back home to them, and whether they came back in one piece. One thing I have to compliment the museum on is their use of space. It's obvious that they put lots of thought and design work into the museum itself. Artifacts are displayed not only like a typical museum, but there's artwork going up the walls, and even in some cases, there's artifacts underneath the floor. Probably the most striking experience I had at this museum occurred on my first visit. I had recently redeployed back home from Iraq. When I walked into the American section of the museum, I saw a large display case that displayed dozens of army tunics, each displaying a unique division patch. When I walked by this exhibit, I saw a tunic that displayed the 3rd Infantry patch, one very much like this that was placed on my shoulder in Iraq. For me, it reminded me how close I was tied to a soldier that fought on a battlefield close to 100 years prior. In the end, I have to say, the National World War I Museum and Memorial is a remarkable place to visit. I love taking my sons here. I encourage everyone to come visit this museum and explore its fine architecture and amazing exhibits. If you like this video and wish to see more videos on the topic of Army self-development, please subscribe to The Evolving Warfighter. If you have not yet seen the two videos I made when I interviewed Jonathan Casey, the director of the Edward Jones Research Center here at the National World War I Museum and Memorial, you can find the links here.